So I'm in the studio today. I just finished doing an incredibly cool podcast that I'm so excited about. And uh, I'm getting closer. We're getting closer. Kenny Aronoff. I love your podcast. This is going to be really fun. I'm so grateful that you uh, contacted me about doing this. Oh, the dude. I got to leave now. See you later. <laughs> Having you on the podcast is incredible because, <laughs> you know, how I feel about you. It's like, you know, I've, I've done this for 50 years. No, 40 years recording. I'm just talking about the recording part. And you've done it for 50 years. I mean, that's like, that's unheard of in this business to last that long in a business where it flips over so fast. To stay yeah. relevant in this business, it's one of the most difficult businesses in the world. It is. So, so to stay relevant, it's like, and as yeah. we said in my podcast, to play, be so diverse, you know, the amount of people you've played with, it's like everything from country to fusion to jazz to, you know, uh, the obvious James Taylors to Jackson Browns, but then Ray Charles and B.B. King, and then all of a sudden you're on tour with Phil Collins, who obviously you'd think he would know what kind of bass player he wants with him. Everybody uh, else was busy that day. <laughs> yeah, okay. they kept calling you back. Enough about me. Yeah. Just talk, uh, you know, uh, it, it, from the from the standpoint of, of history, I think one of the things that everybody finds fascinating is kind of where we all came from in terms of how we got mm -hmm. to where we are now and, and the journey we've taken. And to me, you're whenever I get called to do a project and they say you're on it, I get really pumped because... And I was so thrilled that I just finished Lyle Lovett's tour and, and the day after I get off tour... We're in the studio together. Oh, that was a damn, yeah, yeah was, we finished the night before, and, and we and it was so much fun cutting all those songs in a day and a half, like thirteen songs or whatever. Sure, band, but you know the connection that we have when we play yeah. is like really pretty deep. So, so just just reminisce about the, the world of Kenny Aronoff. All right, so I grew up in a small town in Western Mass, three thousand people, you know, in the hills, the Berkshires, as they call it, and. Um, me and my twin brother, John, Johnny, we were 10 years old playing outside, and uh, there was nothing to watch on TV back then. <laughs> and so we were always Still outside. Still isn't. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah, right? There isn't. More channels yeah. of nothing. And so we were just out there playing, and one day my mom screams at us. She's on the front porch. Boy, you got to come in here right now. And I'm like, oh, shit. I, what'd we do? And I was usually in trouble. And so, anyway, we go running across the lawn. We get into the family room, and I'm ready to get yelled at. My mom is pointing to this old black and white RCA TV set. has got the rabbit ear antennas. Mm -hmm. you know, we had no cable back then. Tin foil, I think, on top also. <laughs> and there's four guys on the TV set. And they're dressed in suits. They're not like your dad's suits. These are like really cool suits. And they have long hair, which was just starting to happen. And uh, two guys got electric guitars. And then one guy's got electric bass. And then there's the drummer's up on this huge riser, and he's got long hair and the suit on. Anyway, they break into some rock and roll, and I'm like, what the fuck is that? I was, like, blown away. Yeah. And uh, I was electrified. It, I'd never felt anything like that. Now, I'd heard rock and roll on the radio because that was the you know, newest thing, but I'd never seen it, you know. And um, anyway, at that split second, I would say i realized what my purpose in life is what i want to do before i even knew what the word purpose in life meant mm -hmm. but i know i just want to do that i want to be part of a, a band like that and do that so i go mom who are these guys she says well they're the beatles i said well i want to play in the beatles call them up get me in the band <laughs> and that's what a 10 year old kid mom get me in the band and uh i'm done with piano lessons i want to play drums I'm sure you can identify. Yeah. I'm like, man, I mean, just we didn't go, I mean, this, the whole thing. And, um, well, my mom didn't call up the Beatles, that's for sure. And my mom didn't get, my mom and dad didn't get me a drum set, you know, and we didn't have a lot of money. And I was seriously bummed out. So, I mean, you have to understand, this was all new to me. I didn't know, who, there was no mentor to call up Johnny's dad, say, hey, can you give me the Beatles? You know, I, it, it was, there was no mentor, there was no me method, there was no book. There, heck, there was no internet, so you couldn't yeah. even watch this stuff. Yeah. There was nobody posting this stuff on Twitter or TikToks or Instagram. So, How lucky are people today, the uh, the amount yeah, of information, information that they can get to? It's incredible. So, I, you know, I, I, my mom and dad saw I was going crazy. I was buying 45s and uh, records, and I, I was banging on everything. So they finally 
they go to Manny's in New York. So we live about three hours from the city. Go to Manny's to get a $20 snare drum and a cymbal. I'm standing up and I'm practicing these things and I start a band called the Alley Cats. Oh, Ten years ago, I started the Alley Cats. Of course, our theme was the Alley Cat. And we played Beatles music. And I just shut my eyes, you know, imagining. I had long hair, which never quite happened. And girls going crazy over me, which did happen. And the best part of this, 50 years later, I became who I am. I get called to do a CBS special called The Night That Changed America, honoring the Beatles for the Ed Sullivan show that me and 73 million people saw. And I get to play with Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr, the two remaining Beatles, and I'm like, are you kidding me? That's a circle. Yeah, edge. and so that was that was iconic. And I uh, played, you know, with you know how it is when we do these gigs. You know, Stevie Wonder, Joe Walsh, uh, Dave Grohl, uh, uh, Jeff Lynne from Mina Lowe, uh, John Legend, Leisha Keys, John Mayer, Keith Urban, and on and on. So I get done. There's like 30 minutes left in the show. I'm gonna go watch the rest of it out in the audience, and um, I go look for my wife. And and there's these. Elite seats in the middle. It's Tom Hanks, his wife, Ringo Starr's wife, Paul McCartney's girlfriend, George Harrison, John Lennon's widows, and then some actors like uh, Johnny Depp, Tom Cruise, um, Sean Penn. And they're all acknowledging me because they just see me on the big screen. I knew most of them, but Ringo, who I'd played the Grammys with the night before and did a, uh, honored him for Dave Lynch Foundation two weeks before and did Double Drums with him, but I never had a chance to really talk to him one on one. So he's going, bravo, Kenny, great job. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, this is... What's wrong with this picture? Yeah. <laughs> so I get down on one knee because everyone's looking at me, and I'm like, let's get down on one knee. I'm trying to think of what I'm saying, what I'm going to say to him. He goes, it's okay, I'm already married. <laughs> That's on one knee. He's nuts. He's <laughs> a piece of work. <laughs> well, you probably know him better than me, but wow. And so I said, you know, you're the reason I play drums. You're the reason why I play rock and roll, and you and the Beatles set me on a course at age 10 that I've been on ever since. I just want to thank you. And I How walked cool. away and thought, hey, you know what? In order to be great at anything, you got to love it. you got to love it, man. It's, yeah. not, it's here. It's not up here. It's here. Yeah. And that's when that, that, so full circle, that's when I realized, and it goes deeper than that because I started thinking, because when you're coming from a place like that, that's what made me, uh, like you, unstoppable, undeniable, and you're 100% authentic. This is who I am, man. You can't argue with that. You can say, well, you don't feel that way. Well, I do. Yeah. And this is what I want to do, and this is what I'm going to do. Hence, in and out of a million relationships <laughs> when I was a kid. But, uh, but the ripple effect of your joy and happiness from doing what you do affects everybody around the room, and that's why guys like you and me have constantly worked. It's not just because we play our instruments great. It's because we love what we do, and why wouldn't you want to have somebody that makes you feel good in your band? Exactly, exactly. And that's basically my story, the well, big broad strokes. Well, when when so what eventually, because so you started out feeling you know, like just playing Beatles, stuff like that, eventually ending up like because you got most of the notoriety that that i was aware of in the beginning was with Mellencamp, right, right. And, and how did that all come about well you know in i'll go back to when i was a kid i just played in bands self-taught and in my sophomore year uh some kid in my town was getting better and i'm like wow tommy what are you doing he says i'm taking lessons from the percussions from the boston symphony orchestra I'm like, well I'm, I'm gonna do that <laughs> I went to my first lesson. He goes, uh, what's your name, son? I said, Kenny. Kenny what? I'm like, Kenny Aronoff. What have you prepared for me today? I'm like, what? <laughs> he says, well, you, you prepare a mallet piece? I said, what are mallets? Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah. So Marimba, vibes. I, said, I don't play Marimba vibes. He says, will you have a timpani piece for me? I said, never hit a timpani in my life. He goes, you know, I'm feeling like, meow. He says, well, what? What do you play? I said, drum set. Well, let's go downstairs. I wasn't even in the house. I was outside. Let's go downstairs. He put on Spinning Wheels by Blood, Sweat, oh, great. Which I'd been playing to. You know, I had the stereo and I'm playing to it. And in about 30 seconds, he rips me off the drum set, pushes me over to a practice pad. Now, this was a life-changing moment. I could have gone... I was popular in school. I was in the best band. I was in the sports. I was... Every, we were... Me and my twin brother were popular. But something hit me. I went, wow, I need this guy. 
Mm -hmm. I never met this kind of guy before. This guy's got something that I've never seen. So I started studying with him. Spent two years studying. Uh, he got me in the mallets, got me in the timpani, and reading. You know, I wasn't great at it, but it was good enough for me to get in. See, back then, uh, it's, it was in the 60s, or no, 70, 71. There was no school of rock. I thought, well, I'm going to go to college, study music. And so I picked classical music as my major because mm. uh, uh, it was either jazz or classical. Even though I was a drummer, it seemed to make more sense to do classical. Maybe I'll get into an orchestra. I don't know. Anyway, I did one year at UMass. I transferred to Indiana University, number one school of music in classical. I spent one summer, you had to audition, I got into a, a program run by Juilliard, second best school in classical music, uh, at Aspen School of Music. Got my ass crushed. These, mm. I, I think I was an alternate, because, I mean, these guys up there were like playing timpani and mouths when they're in their diapers, you know, and here I am yeah. doing scales. But that teacher up there taught at Indiana University, and I demanded an audition. He said, well, I'll come back in January. I went, no, 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 I'm auditioning right now. I'm going to Indiana, the number one school in music. And he said, I'll come back in January. I went, no, I, I want to audition now. And he went, wow, okay. I think he was thinking, wow, I'm going to enjoy teaching this kid because he knows what he's, he wants. Yeah, he's got the energy. To, yeah, so yeah. I, I got in. He had to audition for four different departments. I got in, and I just worked my way from the bottom. One thing that I did, I'm like the tortoise. One of the most talented by a long shot. But I'd be the guy that would practice till 2 in the morning till they throw me out of the building. You do that for a long time, and you're going to get better. Yeah. Every summer I auditioned to get into Tanglewood, which is the number one student orchestra in the country run by the Boston Symphony Orchestra, three miles from my house in Stockbridge, in a little town called Lennox, Mass. And I struck out the first year. Auditioned for Vic Firth, the Tempest, the Boston Symphony Orchestra. I sucked. Came back the next year, I was better. Struck out. Came back a third year. Struck out. Now it was like competition for me. I came back a fourth year and got in. Wow, that's great. And I got to work with Leonard Bernstein, Sergio Zauer, Aaron Copeland. One of these are great American composers. Oh, God, yeah. The most elite orchestra. Okay, the point is... I graduate Indiana University, and I get into the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra. And the, the big point in the story is I turned it down. Why, why would Kenny Aronoff turn that down? That, that's what he was obviously going for. I turned it down, and thank God I did, because that was the crossroads when I really followed my heart. I still wanted to be in the Beatles. Yeah. I mean, all through college, I was playing in clubs, any style of music, any time I could play the drums, I was fusion, rock, country, Latin, R&B, funk, you name it. I was doing it. But I hadn't studied drum set at school. It was all classical. And I was always wondering, where were those roads going to meet? Mm -hmm. had, I didn't figure it out yet. I was like, wow. Oh. So I turned it down. I turned down certainty for complete uncertainty. I'm going to go back home to my parents' house, and once again, I don't know how to get into a rock band, a, a famous rock band. I had no connections. I started studying drum set with a teacher in Boston, New York, spent a year practicing eight hours a day, thinking, like, I got to catch up to Steve Gadd, Vinnie Caliuta, Steve Smith, uh, Jeff Piccaro, all these guys. I mean, I'm sitting in my the house I grew up in. I moved to Indiana, started a band. The business model was write songs, get a record deal, they give you money, you make a record, go on tour, sell a product, do it again and again and again, you become a famous band. Struck out. Three years in Indiana, struck out. I'm going to move to New York. A week before I go to New York, life-changing lunch I had with this singer-songwriter. She says, what are you doing? I said, Mom, I'm going to New York, trying to make it. She says, hey, you know, there's this guy in Bloomington, and you might have heard of him. He's on MTV, this new network, and... He's got records on the radio, and he just came off tour. His band was opening up for Kiss, and they fired his drummer last night. I went, bing, 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 records, MTV, touring. What? That's what I've always wanted to do. I go yeah. running out of the restaurant to a pay phone, because there was no cell phone, put a quarter in, call up the guitar player, said, Mike, it's Kenny Aronoff. Man, I hear you might need the drummer. He said, yeah, yeah. Look, we're trying to sort some stuff out. Come back. Call me in two weeks. I went right to the record store, bought the record, wrote 
wrote, because I could write music, wrote every note that the drummer did on that record, memorized it, auditioned two weeks later, got the audition, and by the way, after two songs, that was it, the audition, he, the, this guy yells for the guitar player, Mike, to go upstairs, and he's yelling, ah, Mike, get up here. I go, wow. Doesn't seem like a real nice guy. Mike comes down 10 minutes later. I want to do it. It's like Les Paul through a Marshall, you know, a, 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 you know, Fender, you know, I mean, Fender, I don't know what it was, Stratocaster maybe through a, you know, a, a Fender amp. Uh, did I say Fender Stratocaster? Was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, anyway, in bass, it was like this rock thing, you know, which I loved. <laughs> Mike comes down and says, welcome to hell. I was like, yeah, I'm in the band. What's hell? Hmm. Anyway, five weeks later, <laughs> I'm in the studio out here at Cherokee. Steve Cropper was the producer. And after two days, I'm, I'm sitting here like, I did it. I see. I told you. I've I tell made everybody. It. I did it. Yeah. You know, all that hard work, self-discipline, perseverance. You know, I'm in flow. Everything's great. After two days, I get fired from the record. And <laughs> the reason why, the reason why, is I had no experience making records. And I'll ask drummers. Or anybody, really. When you make records, say, what's your purpose of making a record? They go, oh, God. Or not purpose. Well, yeah, what's your purpose? What do you, what's the end game? Come up with the right beat, feel, get along. And nope. Mm -mm. The North Star? Get the goddamn song on the radio to be a number one hit. It ain't about you. It's about the song. Mm -hmm. It's about that guy. I had no idea. I thought it was all about me because you're practicing eight hours a day. It's all about you. But to be Tom Brady or somebody who's like wins Super Bowls, it's about the, the, the team, the band. Yep. And I had no idea. I never even thought about it. They, they don't tell you this stuff in a rule book, you know, or a manual. I didn't know how to serve anybody. It was all about me. Yeah. So I'm having a meeting. And by the way, I'll just cut to the chase. This guy was Johnny Cougar. He turned to John Mellencamp. We're at the Chateau Marmont on Sunset, and he says... Kenny, it's a band meeting. Uh, you're not playing on the record. You're going home. By the way, I thought he was firing me. It wasn't. It was Cropper. He wanted to get the record done. It was tape back then, so there was no Pro Tools. There was no fixing. Yeah. You're punching drums in and out is tricky. In, okay, but the hi-hat, stiffened sound. You have to really be a professional. I'm working with click tracks and not being uptight. And uh, He needed to get this record done in eight weeks. That means tracks, overdubs, vocals. Um, you know, mixing, mixing that. I yeah. Mean, that's a, that's a tight I get schedule. It. Get the professionals. It was Ed Green, Rick Slosher. I'm sure you work with Rick yeah, Slosher. We're, we're, when I was studying piano, I had, by the time I got to my third piano teacher, I was like 12 years old. Mm -hmm. She, If I would have started with her, I would have probably stayed with piano because the, the first two, it wasn't... Right. I, uh, I was successful, but I was completely out of, lost my mind. So the last one I ended up with was a, a woman named Debbie Green. And one day I'm in the studio working with Ed Green and we start talking about growing up and all this. And I said, yeah, I had a great piano teacher, Debbie Green. And he goes, that was my mom. And, he, and chances are they, they had converted their garage into her studio. Chances are Ed was probably in the house. I was 12 years old, so he was probably about 12, 13, too. And he was in the house, and I was oh taking God. lessons from his mom. <laughs> what a story. Yeah, it's just funny how these different things wow. that happen in our lives. Wow. But Yeah, I worked, and Rick Schlosser did uh, one tour and an album right? with James. Yeah, I think Rick, Rick lives in Mexico now. Yeah, he reached out to me. Maybe about eight years ago, I went, congratulations, Kenny. I always thought you were going to make it. I'm like, ah, nah. He said, and here's what he said. I'll back up. So John tells me you're going to make the record, and I said, and I was completely overwhelmed and freaked. I felt like a loser. And I didn't know it back then, because I turned into a fight or fight guy. I went, there's no freaking way I'm going home. Yeah. And the reason why is because he was taking away my purpose, like, what? No, no, I'm not going back to Indiana. Yeah. And I said, well, listen, my studio drummer, he goes, uh, well, yeah, but you're not playing on the record. And I went, well, I'm going to go in the studio. I'm fumbling. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in the studio and watch these guys play my drum parts on your record, and I'll learn from them, and I'll get better, because I'm your drummer. That's good, right? He didn't say jack shit. I'm like, mm. okay, I'll work for free. I'll sleep on the couch. And he went, 
It's like, yeah. You just, you said the right thing. I know. It's like, what employer doesn't mind having an employee that says, I'll work for free? Yeah. So I did go in the studio, and I did learn a lot. And I was humbled, and I went back home, and I went, all right. Now I got to be the drummer for him. I got to serve a song. Got to get his songs on the radio. Okay. So two years later, I said, I'm going to make the next record. It's fast forward two years. I'm in the studio. Criteria, the hardest record I've ever made. John was going through a divorce. John almost died on a motorcycle in front of me at 80 miles an hour in the dark. Dog jumped out in front of his Harley. Bike goes down. He jumps on top of the bike. I didn't know he jumped on top. All I just saw was a sparks and an explosion. He had jumped on the bike, and when he hit the tree, he pushed off. Uh, he was a miserable son of a bitch back then. Fired two people in the band. He and I almost got a fist fight, and he was about to lose his record deal. Anyway, I walk in one day, nine weeks in the studio. We didn't do jack shit, maybe four songs. I walk in, and Don Gaiman, this producer, co-producer, has got this metal box. And I'm like, Don, what's that? He says, well, the Bee Gees are using it next door. It's the newest thing, man. And it's the newest thing. And uh, we're going to try it on this song that we can't seem to arrange called Jack and Diane. Um, it's called the Lin One Drum Machine. I went, Drum machine? Yeah. I completely freak. I'm like, <laughs> now I'm getting replaced by a machine. And this is what I call adapt or die, man. This yeah. is that moment where you either adapt or you will die. Yeah. I grabbed the machine, grabbed the manual, said, well, I'm programming it. I learned how to program it, give the machine back. And I'm sitting in the control room going, no, in the, in the lounge going, am I in the horse and buggy business and the car just showed up? I'm going out. Yeah. And all of a sudden I get called in two hours later. John goes, Aronoff, we need a drum solo. We need a drum thing after the second chorus. And I'm like, on a ballot? Now, In the Air Tonight was out. So there was already a, a model of, you know, bring the real drums in after the machine. So I'm like, I'm like excited, but I'm terrified. If, if I lose, if I fuck up, I'm gonna lose my job. Yeah. And so I went, I right, gotta serve the song, serve the song. Gotta come up with something that's gonna explode through these little Car like stereo the speakers. Oratone speakers. And yeah. Stuff like that. And um, I sp thank God they spent all day. See, drums were usually recorded in vocal booths. Now they put them in the big room, and nobody knew where to put the mics. The close mics, obvious. Overheads, obvious. But nobody knew where to put the, the mics in the big room because there's a reflection or there's a time delay from yeah. what the drum set and those mics. That whole time I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to play, and finally I figured out... Long and short of it, I come up with this thing. Uh, there was a lot of trial and error, and I was just glad the song made it on the record. All right, the record comes out. They release Hurt So Good. Back then, what they would do is they would test your record out yeah. on uh, album-oriented rock stations, and people would call up and go, oh, I like that song. And they go, looks like 10,000 kids like this song. Let's release it across America, you know? Well, they release Hurt So Good. It goes to number two. We're, MTV embraced John. Nobody had seen Indiana before. Yeah. We're in these videos. Uh, for some reason, and, and wouldn't you know it, when we were doing Hurt So Good at Cherokee the second time, uh, the, this, the vice president of the record label comes and says, nah, I don't get it. I don't understand this song. You, you should try <laughs> to be like Neil Diamond. John walked him to the... Uh, the front, the door, and kicked him in the ass on the sidewalk, into the on the sidewalk. Basically, we lost our record deal for a second. John was like, "But the song comes." I'm sure that guy was next to John when pictures were taken. Yeah, I told the kid it was going to. Oh be yeah, good. of course. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we didn't get to number one because I the Tiger was number one and Rocky was out. And yeah, there's always all this other drama that you goes and I, on. I, about I this asked. Stuff. I asked uh, somebody once. I uh, says, why couldn't the Polygram just lay down a couple million dollars? said, because the Scotty brothers were behind Eye of the Tiger, and the Scotty brothers were basically in the mafia. You know, yeah. Polygram probably went, we'll let this one go. Anyway, Jack and Diane starts testing by the audience, the radio audience. We love that song. Gets released as a single, goes to number one. John's biggest number one hit single, and it features that drum break. That So John's career completely blows up. Mine takes off. I was in the same room to Chateau Marmont when that song went to number one that I got fired in. But here was my reaction. You'll appreciate this. I was excited for two seconds. And then I went, I'm not number one. I'm not that good. I got to do it again. Oh, shit. 
but we're not going to make a record for another year or two. Yeah. And I, I need John to write a song so I can come up with a beat to show that I'm not, that I am good. Yeah. And that was my thing. I was never satisfied. Got a touchdown, I want another touchdown. Yep. And that was the right attitude. Because if you walk around thinking you're number one, watch, check this out. You won't be number one next year. You're number two. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the beginning. And you know what? That, from that point on, whenever John wrote a song on acoustic guitar, he'd play it once or twice. He'd look at me and go, hey, Aronoff, what do you got? And I'd be going, like, well, why does he keep asking me? Because he wanted me to make him another gazillion dollars. Exactly. And so, yeah, that, and then everything just whoosh, took off, you know, from that point on. I just kept producing drum beats for his songs. That's great. And then you ended, so and between he, because so I remember when we were doing, one of the most enjoyable gigs I remember playing was when we did the John Lennon 70th oh, birthday dude, or whatever yeah. at, the, at Madison Square Garden, yeah. and we got to play with all those people. And I think you had just finished up with Fogarty at that point. Yeah. And so how did, so what went from Mellencamp to Fogarty? Well, actually, when I was still with Mellencamp, I did this rhythm country blues record with Don Was. It was basically Memphis meets Nashville. So okay. they pair up people like, um, yeah, you would have done except that Don was the bass player. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but they pair up like, you know, <laughs> Tanya Tucker with Little Richard. Yeah. They pair up um, uh, George Jones and... Um, it was George Jones? No, it was Conway Twitty and Sam from Sam and Dave. Dave yeah, and jo and Conway Twitty died a month later. Rainy night in Georgia. BB King and George Jones, uh, the Staple Singers and Marty Stewart. It was incredible. That's great. So we did a live show. I should say it was the second time I played with John. We did Farm Aid in ninety eighty six, and one of the guys was John Fogarty, and that was the first time. And John was kind of quiet, you know, but he took note. I didn't know. He told me that later. He liked my energy. And then we did this show. He went, oh, there's Kenny again. He says, wow, he can play anything and everything. And then in 95, I was still with John. My last year with John was 96. John Fogarty's doing this record. Did you play in Blue Moon Swamp at all? He, he hired 30 different drummers. I was the 30th. Yeah. I mean, everybody. And granted, he kept. he was trying to find his way into how to make this next record. Because, you see, when he, he dissolved Credence because he was very frustrated that his manager, Saul Zanz, was getting all the publishing. To get out of his deal, he gave him his publishing, and he was bitter about his career. And he, then he came back and started becoming John Fogarty, but would not, would not uh, play his songs that he'd written with Credence. Yeah. To yeah. kind of like, you know, well, I'm not going to put any money into into that guy's pocket until John was playing at the Palomino Club with like, I want to say it was like uh, Bob Dylan, it was either George Harrison or somebody of that nature, and John goes, they, they go, hey, um, what, what song are you going to play that, that, that you wrote with Queen? He says, well, I don't play my songs. And I think Dylan or somebody went up to him and says, dude, if you don't start playing Proud Mary, they're going to think uh, Tina Turner wrote it. Yeah. And so that's when we went, Thing. Okay, so because they had that like where Henley when he first started doing his solo career didn't want to do any Eagles right, songs, of course not. but Just everybody wanted to, wanted to hear the Eagles But song. yeah, the reason they're there is to hear those songs because yeah. they don't know you as a solo artist no. yet. Well, I did. I was his thirtieth drummer. After the first day, he goes, "You're the drummer I've been looking for. Mm. You want to come back tomorrow?" And the way he recorded it was just Bob Glob, me, and him. Bass, guitar, singer, drums. But I didn't know they were just going for the drum tracks. No click track. They use a click to count off. They do to tape. Two takes, go and listen. Two takes, go and listen. Two takes, go and listen. After eight takes, I went, that's damn good. I went, John, John that's pretty good. He says, ah, I think I'm going to revisit this for a while. Says, Let's just keep going. Three and a half hours. Um, we have a lunch break. Then we go to the next song. John says, come back the next day. I'm like, all right. Go, what are we doing today? And John goes, oh, we're gonna do the same two songs. I'm like, oh, really? What, uh, is there anything you need me to do? Just keep doing the same. Yeah. Wednesday. It's perfect. Don't change a thing. One more time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? What? Next day, Wednesday, same two songs. Thursday, I'm like, ready to shoot myself. Same two songs. Friday, same two songs. I'm like, 
what the heck? Apparently, he would do this, and on, he tend to pick take 12 or 13 on Friday. And the only way I can see it is, we, you go through this process, by the time you were Friday, you would, it'd like you'd been on tour or something. Yeah. And it came out the other end, and all of a sudden, he heard this magic. But the weird thing is they were only getting drum tricks. So, whatever, but John's a genius. So I kept doing it, and eventually went on tour with him. Um, yeah. And that was the beginning of that relationship, and I played with him on and off for 29 years. And right now I'm not with him. He's got his son's band is is playing behind him, and uh, it was it, you know I mean the the songs I mean it was Creed songs it was Fogarty songs he's a genius I mean he's br brilliant yeah you know? no his his body of work and the fact that he's held onto his pipes because he still sounds like John from the sixties same keys yeah I mean same it, keys. he's an anomaly in this business yeah he's like seventy seven he's seventy eight I mean yeah, as a like singer that. that's tough yeah no. I mean everybody goes down yeah he didn't. Uh, you know, um, yeah, it, it's incredible, you know, he's, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, he, he, I remember him, I remember got criticized a couple of times, like, well, Kenny obviously doesn't, didn't get, didn't listen to those Creed and songs, he doesn't sound like, you know, Doug Clifford. John said the first day I was with him, don't sound like Doug Clifford. <laughs> <laughs> of course he said that. He didn't want to sound like the Credence. He wants yeah. to sound like... Well, John. I remember being in the studio doing a, a, a solo Huey Lewis album uh, at Bill Schnee's studio. Yeah. And uh, the, I think the label finally just said, it's too much like the news. <laughs> it's like, he was trying to get away from it, but there's no getting away from it. No. And they finally just kind of pull the plug on, yeah. on the thing. So it's it's tough when these guys, they have an identity that's so established with something and it's like being an actor in a, in a hit oh, yeah. tv show and then trying to get other work and they just nobody will hire you because they go, you know I, I mean i went through this so many times where people would they would assume because of like me starting with james taylor that i couldn't play rock you know because it was exactly. all the sensitive music but i was going when i met james i was only playing rock and the band I was in, Wolfgang, was a total rock band. And when I heard James's music, I had never played anything like that before. Yeah. But people immediately, when they find you, yeah. that's what they associate you with. And I'd be working on records where they would say, well, we'll have you play on the ballads. And then we got so-and-so is going to play. And I'm going, that's the one out stuff I want to play yeah. on. And it took, it, it took a whole lot of different things going on, you know. Or like what people will talk about, you know, Cobham's Spectrum album. And they'll always go, who played bass on that? And they'll and go, huh? And I go, it was me. And they go, really? Really? That's you? Yeah. You know, but they know that it was Tommy Bolin, and they know it was, you know, but for some Dude, reason they the haven't read thing. The, That's what happened to me when I went, yeah. I went like, what? But then it made sense, because I know, I know your background, and I can relate to this having played everything. I recorded with the Buddy Rich Big Band. They sent me rock songs. I went, no. Yeah. I want to play the jazz stuff. Yeah. And I did. And I, it, people, and I did Straight No Chaser, which was terrifying, most terrifying session I ever did, and blazing fast. And I always tell people, if you want to make some money, make a bet. You go say to somebody, who, who do you think played drums on that? They will never say it's me. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Ever. I mean, it's like ding, 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 ding. But it's so great to have that in your arsenal. Yeah, I know. If the call comes, you go, oh, I'm good. I'm yeah. good. Let's do it. Dude, that was yeah. You know, in the in in the uh, the session thing, you know how that happened was with John in nineteen eighty eight. We were flying around in private jets, we were selling on arenas, and uh comes up to the last show of the Jubilee tour, which we were huge. Staying at Ritz Carlton's, you know, we were living like rock stars. No opening act, just us. Yeah. Could do two nights at Madison Square Garden. John comes up to me at the last show at Summerfest in Milwaukee where you're from originally, throws me a bonus check. He says, hey, I'm off. I quit in the business for three years. Here's your bonus. Don't spend it in one place. I just got divorced, got ch a child, so I got child support, and I'm going, I'm like completely threw me off guard. I went, oh, my God. If this guy works, I work. If he doesn't work, I don't work because we'd work straight for eight years nonstop, yeah. nonstop, maybe a month off. I went, oh, my God. Next day I wake up and I go, 
you know, I've been working for one rock star, and now I'm going to work with all the others. And I'm never going to work with one person again. Yeah. Because I don't want to go through that. So what happens, I start pounding the pavement, coming to L.A. I'd have sessions here and there because people liked my drum sound from the 80s. But I was on the phone, hustling, calling, calling. And finally, I get this call from Don Was, who was from Was Not Was, and had produced a song from uh, Love Shack from uh, B-52's record, yeah. and he'd done Nick of Time by Bonnie Ray. So he calls me up and goes, Hey, Kenny, it's Don Was. First of all, I thought he was a black guy because Don Was had black guys in the band. I'm like, oh, cool, man. Was Not Was, man. He says, yeah, man, I would like to do an Iggy Pop record. I'm like, oh. Are you kidding? Iggy Pop? I'm like, yes. He says, meet me at the record plant tomorrow or something. I go down there, I see Sweet Pea and the other two background singers. Yeah, Harry Black Bowens guy. probably. Harry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Black guys. I go up to Sweet Pea and say, you Don Woods? I ain't no Don Woods. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I, Sweet Pea was, was such a piece of work. <laughs> yeah. Wow, what a maniac. What a maniac. And, but he'd kill for you, man. If he liked oh, you, yeah. he loved me. So, hey, what are you doing? Hey, motherfucker, what are you doing? Yeah. Detroit, all the way. Yeah. So I'm looking at these two white guys over there, and they're laughing their heads off. I go up to them, and, man, I just blew it, man. Tell me when Don shows up. Don says, I'm Don was. <laughs> <laughs> you afro, barefoot. Yeah, I mean. He goes, hey, I'm Don was. I'm like, oh, well, okay, okay. Anyway, <laughs> I do Iggy Pop and we're re recording. Waddy was on that record. Yeah. It was Waddy. He'll love this. So, you know, I'm pounding like a mofo because it's Iggy Pop I don't even have my shirt on duct tape my headphones <laughs> Waddy turns around and says do you have to play so loud I went well dude it's rock and roll you got a Marshall and you got a Les Paul yeah <laughs> and Drayton, oh, Charlie funny. Drayton was on bass oh yeah so anyway they said oh Don's not going to be in for walks he's gone to the Grammy oh he has to leave early he's going to the Grammys and I'm like Grammy Smammys I'm just like I'm on Iggy Pop's record all of a sudden I went Don just won a Grammy for Nick of Time, and then he won a Grammy for Love Shack. And then all of a sudden, Don is getting all the calls to produce Elton John, Bob Dylan, uh, uh, Bob Seger, and I'm getting the call. And that's what basically really launched my session. That's great. Because then I became, as uh, uh, Mike Beard said, uh, yeah, he's a flavor of the month. Well, I was. For a second, but then the flavor didn't go away. Yeah, you know, if everybody likes vanilla, <laughs> yeah, whatever it takes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that I, I'd say that was the the big. So because I was everything Don did was big. Yeah, yeah, he was re Stones everything. I mean, he yeah. was like, and he's still, you know, I mean, still he's is. still strong because he's really good at what he does. Yep. it's that simple. He's good at what he does. So the thing is, like you. I had two careers. I got the session career, and I was part of a band with a live career. Yeah. And it's interesting how you probably can relate. People want to own you. Yeah. You're not on retainer, but they want to own you. So, like, with Fogarty, I went out and did a tour. It was great. And then it's over. Yeah. So I'm doing sessions. Then I get a call to do audition for the Smashing Pumpkins, which this is that moment where, like, all of a sudden, are you kidding me? And that's what the whole world said. Who's playing drums with the Pumpkins? Kenny Aaron? What? Yeah, and, and they were sitting really high. Oh, they were the that, biggest alternative yeah. band in the world. Bigger yeah. than Nirvana, bigger than Soundgarden, yeah. bigger than Pearl Jam. And for whatever reason, I win the audition. I get the gig. I looked at it as like this. I mean, this is huge. It was on all over VH1, all over MTV. It's like they picked Mel Camp's drummer. And I remember... I had to make the phone call to John Fogarty saying I, they had no tour planned. But I had to let them know that I'm not available during this time. Yeah. And they were devastated. I'm like, well, and I tell people today, Kenny, and I know this is you, Kenny works seven days a week. If you want to hold me, you have to pay me to hold me because I will get a call. Yeah. I will get a call. And when they start saying, well, we're not paying for the travel or half day travel, I went, if, it's, if, if, if I'm in Vegas and I can get to L.A. and work, fine. But when I'm on the plane, I can't work and get my rate. So you got to pay me for that day. Yeah. It's, that, that's one thing. I mean, I've never had a gig that, that where there was a retainer. 
on right. it. Right. And uh, when, I, when I think back to You know to what? Like, I, the, I never have... Wait, have I? Well, I did with Melican. It was so small, I took myself off the retainer. Okay. But I know the guys that were like in Neil Diamond's band. Oh, yeah. I mean, they were... Uh, I would talk to them. They were make Their retainer was more than I made all year yeah. working, and they didn't have to work. Yeah. But they had to be there if Neil suddenly said, uh, we got something this week. Yeah. And well, he was rare. He took care of his band. Oh, no, he was great. He was he great. He took care of... they get like 25 years in the band, you get a Harley, you know... Uh, it was uh, this. He was a lot of perks. I mean, I've known guys like that that were in something that did really well, and next thing you know, there's a Rolls Royce on their driveway, and you kind of go, "Wow." Well, you know, there was only a few of those gigs. You know, I know Paul McCartney takes care of his people. Eric Clapton, in his heyday, would you know he was paying those yeah. guys some great money. Uh, if you're in the Food Fighters, you know, I mean, those who it, it all there's so from, few and far between. For, yeah. That's about it. I've never been yeah. in one of those situations. I mean, I can't, I, I, but I can't complain because because I've loved what I've done, and and it's all been you know, yeah. nobody burned me. On anything, yeah. so I, I can't complain about that. No, I mean th those are the exceptions. Yeah, yeah. The, what we're doing is we 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 get paid well. We're always working. Yeah, it's and that's that's as luck. An idle mind is a devil's playground. Yeah, I think the only thing for me that I, that I regret, and I, it, it's not a, a big regret, but there's a part of me that it would have been great to have been in a hit band. Yeah, where that's all you had to do was yeah. that band, and you made. A shitload of money. Yeah. I mean, I think of, and I don't mean this in a begrudging way at all, but I think of like Flea in the Chili Peppers, yeah. and you know, I make millions of dollars. Yeah. And the only thing you really need to know is Chili Peppers tunes. Where, yeah. from my standpoint, every day practically, I'm joining a new band, I'm learning new material, I'm going out on the road, having to like f figure out, you know, like learn maybe like eighty songs or so for a tour because yeah. we don't know what's going to be called up yeah. and. And everything's memorized and, and all that. And you just kind of go, I wouldn't want to give that up because the variety is the thing that's yeah. made this so interesting to me. But there's a part of me that still thought, it would have really been nice just to chill out. And you go, oh, we're not touring this year, but you got so much mailbox money coming yeah. in and all that that you just, who gives a shit? Yeah. You know, you're, you're cool. Oh, I know. And but that's not been the world I live in. No. But, but I, I, I could certainly not complain when I get a, when that phone rings and I get to hit it. I just yeah. go, yeah, this is good. Well, the thing is, is that, you know, like we said, that's far and few between. It stems from the, the top. I remember, I won't mention the bands, but some of the newer bands, you know, people can't even like, they're selling out stadiums and they're paying their band 1500 a week. Yeah. Because they can. Yeah. You don't like it? We'll get somebody else. Yeah. Right, right out of Berkeley. Because it really doesn't matter. You don't matter. As a matter of fact, they might even be playing backing tracks and they're playing along. Just, yeah. It's, so it's like, wow. Yeah. Oh man, it's I'm a not, different world altogether. Whole different. Well, because you're not selling records. I mean, yeah. I'm on three records that sold forty million. Two, Celine, one of them, probably you're on Celine Dion record. Did you do that Celine Dion? Was it? No, we did the Willie Nelson with uh, Sir Lettick, Man. Sir yeah, though the Great Divide yeah, was the great. name of that. That was great. Yeah, <laughs> that was great. And did when you, you left Celine? for the last tune, <laughs> did you what you, you 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 had to, you had another session, you split, and then we did that song. Um, I remain or you remain, and you went. How come I wasn't on that? We went, it's because you left to go do another. Yeah, thing. exactly. That was a great record. That's really that was a good great. album. Ma that, Matt's a really good producer. Is that what's right there? No, that's Willie. Uh, Willie oh, that's Nelson in friends. live kicking. Live and kicking. Were you on that one too? No, I didn't do that one. But didn't we do the um, he and Cheryl's Crossroads? Yes. Together. Yep. That was great. And then when we, we did, did it, live. It, yeah, we that was great live. with Matt. And, yeah. and and Doug Moore and Dean, I think. There's a whole bunch on there. That was yeah. really... And then we did the um, uh, the Grammys with Willie and, and Merle and, and Christopherson. And, and then that pant load, uh, Blake Shelton, who didn't even say hi to the band or anything. I know. That guy was such a douchebag. Was that the... Wait, was... The, 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 that, that was... Uh, the Highwaymen. Yeah. And the only... They remain, needed to put a, the, yeah. a, a fourth guy in because... Did they have Jamie Johnson? In there, I think Jamie Johnson might have been. Uh, no, uh, no, it was Blake Shelton who they brought well, in. To, no, to, Blake Shelton, but there was another guy because Waylon and uh, Johnny Cash were dead. Yeah, no, I think it was just I think it was Christopherson, Merle, Willie. Oh, you're right. And and, and, right. and but but the weird thing was there was a guitar player uh, on the date, 
and really good. And I said, you know, it's really nice to meet you. It was Merle's son. And he said, oh, actually, we have met. And when I when I went up to Merle's place in oh, Reading um, with Larry London, and we did, and we did, oh, and and the, the, he was a newborn when we went there. The, and now I think he was like that was like twenty years earlier, wow. and there he was playing guitar with his dad. He, he was serious. he was really good. He, he had was, a, another. There was another Merle Haggard son. Yeah. who was a wild mofo. Yeah. Because I got in the elevator with both of them once, and then one was like, "Hey, oh yeah." Drinking, Jack Daniels at 12 in the afternoon. Hey! They're hardcore. Yeah. Hard, he'd probably been up all night. <laughs> yeah, Merle's family compound where they lived was in Redding, California, up oh, in Northern California. Oh, yeah. And oh, uh, he had about 800 acres up there. And uh, when I went there, uh, when uh, when Larry and I went up there, we, the first day we meet the cook, who's, you know, because so food and everything will be taken care of. We meet the cook. It was one of his ex-wives. And we met the housekeeper. It was another ex-wife. And they all had houses on this 800 well, acres, yeah. and they would just drive golf carts between each other's houses. But I remember the, the funniest Merle moment was I was, we were doing an album in Nashville. And, and Merle was real healthy at this point, drinking water and really oh, wow. had, had his, you know, really healthy. But the first day he sounded kind of awful. And this is one of the greatest singers yeah. ever in country music. Yeah. I mean, in his heyday, man, what a set of pipes. And uh, the next day I came in the studio early, and he had already been there like two hours, and he replaced all his vocals from the previous day. Yeah. And I went, Merle, you know, yesterday sucked. Today's great. What happened? He goes, my singing teeth arrived. My singing. He had worn the wrong dentures, and he couldn't enunciate. <laughs> On that first day, so they FedExed out his, the right teeth. And the thing that was, this is why I love this business. I had in early 70s, very early 70s, I had done an album, a Paul Anka record. Yeah. And the, one of the guitar players on it was a guy named Michael Herndon. And, uh, and Michael I, I, he really had aspirations of being a studio guy, but really didn't have, he was a good player, but just didn't have the right psychology. You know? yeah. So he went on and, and studied dentistry. And he ended wow. up, he, he, to this day, is still a Martin and Dorsey. Um, but he ended up opening two dental clinics in Northern California, wow. in Quincy and some other town. Well, I told him the story about Merle, and he loved Merle's music. So I hooked them up, and he actually completely reconstructed Merle's mouth for him because he was an oral reconstructive oh surgeon. God, was... And as a thank you, Michael also had a Pro Tools studio in his dental clinic. So they would go in and Merle could sing and make sure nothing oh. was screwing with his vocals or anything like so that. Could... So he could have... It was like one of these things that was such an interesting whole thing. And then and as a, and beyond paying him as a thank you, when we did one of Michael's albums, Merle did a duet with him. On it as as a thank you on it. Merle was like the coolest guy. I, I, I mean, I, I felt so. One of my favorite pictures in my book is those three guys from that Grammy show all giving me the finger together. Oh, wow. so I've got Merle Christopherson and Willie yeah, yeah. together because I had each of them individually, but this way I got the three of them together. Yeah, and that was a fun got, night. Uh, from that night, um, I got a picture of me, Chris Christopherson. And Merle. Yeah. And thank God I did. Yeah. I look like shit. We all look like this shit. But, yeah. but you know, because Merle's looking like, purposely looking real serious. <laughs> and it was funny. He was a knucklehead. Yeah. What, a, what a piece of you work. You know, it's just, yeah, it's just so, you know, I wanted to get um, Chris Christopherson on my podcast, but, you know, his wife said, you know, ah, he's not doing those right now. Yeah. So, you know, I'm saying, I wish I'd gotten Jerry Lee Lewis before he passed away. Yeah. Because I did his last year and a half of touring. And, um, yeah, I would love to. Oh, God. It, it's when you start losing these guys, there's been so many. I know. You know, I'm sitting here, we were supposed to be doing gigs with Crosby right now. <sighs> yeah. I mean, Hutch and I were going to be trading off right. on that because he was going to be busy with right. Bonnie and I was going to be doing Lyle. So right. we were going to, when gigs came up, yeah. whoever was available was going to go ahead and do that. Well, um, Crosby was living on borrowed time. And well, got... it's one of those things where, you're sad he's gone, and you're amazed he was still here. Yeah. Because he did everything he could not to be here over the years. But of all those guys, he held on to his pipes. He still sang great. He was having trouble playing. He was having serious right. problems with his hands. So 
Steve Postel from the immediate family yeah. was going to be doing it, and he was learning all of David's guitar yeah. parts so that he could cover all of that stuff, and David could just sing on the tour. Wow. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's gone. Did you, I did a Graham, a Graham Nash, no, no, a Gra no, Nash Crosby record with Don Waters mm -hmm. in Nashville. Were you on that? No, or? not that yeah. How many records did they make together? They did. They did a, a number of, of things. Yeah. So. Yeah. But you know, it's just it's just all this kind of stuff. You just kind of, you just reflect on it, and you just feel so blessed that we've gotten to do this, and that we still. It's like people talk to me about stuff, and the weirdest part of doing my YouTube channel has been having to reflect on my past. Because right. I never think about that. I only think about today and tomorrow. Yeah, of course. So to suddenly have to be, I've talked about having to really be doing forensics, you know, and, yeah. and, and looking back, you know, finding all these websites that list all these songs and then yeah. trying to find, you know, credits and, and then remembering what went on in the studio when we were doing that. There's so much that goes into all of this stuff. and, and I, But I just so... Man, you, you kind of realize that you've actually been here and done something. Because when you're sort of living day by day, you never think of it yeah. that way. But then when I think about projects and I think back to when we've been in the studio and all kinds of different albums and stuff, and you just kind of go, what a great run. Yeah. You know, and, and pff, life is so short. I mean, yeah, the, the music definitely documents uh, our journey. Yeah. It's a soundtrack yeah. of our journey. But, you know... Pff, I was talking to D. Snyder the other day, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm at the Maya ruins in Gua uh, was it Guatemala? Yeah." Mm -hmm. He said they're 2000 BC. By 2000, we've been around for 100. I mean, if you're lucky, you'll be around 100 years. But 100 years, what's that? Yeah. But then on the other hand, 100 years ago, the car was. Just barely rolling off, you know, the Model A. Oh, I mean, we've got spacecraft that are on the outer reaches of the universe. Yeah. And it wasn't that long ago the Wright brothers were flying. Yeah. You know, I mean, they said the first Wright brothers plane, th that first flight could have been inside the body of a 747. <laughs> really? Yeah. That short, just a yeah. blip, bloop. Yeah. So Look it's all remarkable, it's but crazy. we know we're still here. And, yeah. you know, well, you think about the dinosaur, 165 million years they live million not a thousand but a yeah. million and what would this planet be like if that asteroid hadn't hit what would the dinosaurs have evolved into yeah you know? exactly yeah i mean that was that was a, a freak thing i don't know happened. if they would have gotten much more evolved because they, they had 165 million years to evolve into something they still had yeah, look, still like the T Rex was still ripping everybody's head off yeah and we're and we're devolving after you know <laughs> You know, fifteen hundred <laughs> years or something. Oh my God! Yeah. Oh my God! It's yeah. Things, things are changing fast. Yeah. It's amazing. Sometimes I think that I actually hit drums for a living. Oh, it's it's shocking. My mom said to my professor when I was freshman at Indiana University, she was a little bit concerned I picked music as my major, yeah. considering there were maybe she go into business, yeah, or law. We, I or think something. we all went down that road with parents. Yeah. My mom goes to my. Professor says, George, Anna, do you think Kenny can make a living hitting drums? <laughs> I mean, is he, uh, is he even talented enough to have a career in music? <laughs> George said, said, Ms. Aronoff, how the hell do I know? It's up to him. Ask me that question in 10 years. So the freakazoid thing was a, uh, a couple of years ago. I said, I wonder what 10 years was after 10 years to a month was Jack and Diane went to number wow. one. Wow. And when I was, my, my six weeks after graduating, I was Mr. Timpany, and I was going to the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra, and George wanted, he purposely did this. He was a deep guy. He said, I want to learn this tambourine excerpt for next week. I'm like, I'm a timpani player. I just want a concerto. I, I learned a violin concerto on marimba with the symphony orchestra and blah, blah, blah. Sit down. I'm like, oh, here we go. He's going to lecture me. Says you don't know what you're gonna be when you get out of here. You, you, you got an education here. You learn discipline and all this stuff. He's going on. Says you might end up being. You don't know. You, you might be. The, you have the right hands to be a basket weaver in Mexico. And he goes on and says someday you might end up being a famous rock and roll drummer. I says I hope not. <laughs> I actually said I hope not because I wasn't there at that second. Yeah. 
That second, I was like, eh, no, nah, I think I want to be Billy Cobham, which would have been... I tell Billy Cobham all the time, you almost completely destroyed my career because I was trying to be you, which was never going to happen. He thinks that's funny. It says, a, I was chasing... Take a great Cobham moment. When, when the section was opening for Mahavishnu Orchestra, one of the gigs we played was the Mississippi River Festival, and Billy's taking a drum solo in one of their songs. Yeah. And I'm standing in the wings with Russ Kunkel and we're watching this. And he breaks his, he's got double kick drums and he breaks his right bass drum pedal. Yeah. So he doubles up on his left foot in his left hand and changes his bass drum pedal during his solo. And I look at Russ and we just said, we're out of here. This is, <laughs> this is not, this does not bode well for our future. <laughs> I mean, did not miss a beat yet. There he is like doubling up on his left side while his right side's the repair man. <laughs> he was a freak of nature. He's a freak of nature. Yeah. I kept thinking, and I went and saw, I said, uh, um, I remember I t went to Cape Cod Coliseum a couple of years later, told my sister, you got to go see the mob. He's been for amazing. I think it was Jean-Luc Ponty was mm -hmm. opening up for him. So we go there, and I'm, I got bad seats, and way in the back, I'm like, God, Billy's gotten smaller. He's lost weight. You know, he's muscular. And, you know, the song starts, you know, he's doing all, you know, John McLaughlin doing this, you know, textural stuff after he bowed to street trim yeah. or whatever. You, you know, and all of a sudden, wow, Billy's killing it. It was Michael Walden. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, there's two of them. Yeah. I'm like. What I I went because I went up to the stage at the end and Michael Walden came out and his, you know yeah his whole thing his whole dishaki or whatever yeah. they call it. Yeah. and I went you're not Billy Cobb's no, I'm Michael Walden Narada Michael Walden I'm like oh, what the heck where yeah. are you guys coming from yeah I've got Michael he's in the book and I got him when uh, when I got Jeff Beck and Rhonda Smith there I oh, saw them wow. all together there you go. And uh, it was great, but I've done some gigs with Michael. He's like a, he's a he he's such a, a, a interesting character. Interesting character. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's nobody like him. But he'll set up his drums, and he has like flowers all around yeah. him. And does Still. This, oh yeah, we did a thing at the Library of Congress, and yeah. he came in. It was like this whole setup, and then we were just going. This is. But awesome. he owns it. He smiles. Oh no, he's he is he is himself. Yeah. And th that's the thing you want. There's another cat that—that yeah. that is what he is. Yeah. It's not like somebody who's going to come in and be what you would like him to be. You're hiring him because that's the cat you want. And when people hire you, they want Kenny yeah. in there. They don't want a drummer. They want Kenny. Yeah. It just so happens Kenny is a great drummer. But well, this is. But that's that's the thing that we try to do is have that identity that that you become more than just your instrument. You become almost an enigma to them. Like, they're not sure why they got to have you there, but they got to have you. Yeah, it's like that's, Japanese projects where they, they want to have that name on the album. Yeah. And you're not necessarily the best guy for it. Yeah. But they, they love being able to just say, you know, have pictures of everybody together yeah. and stuff. And that's cruel. That's really good. Well, that's part of the business. That's, you know, See, you hope you're that guy. Would they care that much to have you? Yeah. And you know, be that guy. Because they got lots of choices. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's that, the thing is for every one of our seats in L.A., there's 10,000 guys that want that job yeah. in there. So you can never give up. You've got to stay relentless if you want to stay viable and, and, and just no matter what your age is, you know, you, you want to be cognizant of what's in the world's going on in music and stuff so that when you get called in, you do, I, the, my kind of mantra that I always use myself is don't become an old fart. <laughs> you know, don't talk about well in my day because then you sound like grandpa who's going yeah. senile. Yeah, you just go. What do you need? Let's yeah. do it. Let's rock. Let's kick some yeah. ass today and have some fun. And it's really fun to me when I get in the studio and I'm working with people like in their twenties and stuff. And the minute you start playing, you are connected. I've been doing a bunch of stuff with guys from Scary Pockets, and well, and that well. that's the same thing. Oh, it's the, the it's this whole scene. But they bring in an artist, and it's, it's the two guys, and then they'll put some other guys together, and they'll bring in an artist, and they'll pick a song and then completely change the arrangement on it, and we cut it live, and it's done. 
Wow. And they've got they got tons of videos. Yeah. Check them out on YouTube. It's really yeah. amazing what they do. Yeah. Um, but it's it's really fun when you're sitting there with you know people that are you know 24 years old or something like that, and you are like boom, you are so connected together because music it does that. Yeah. It's, it really is not a, an age related thing if you're all on, yeah. you're on the same page and you are just let's let's kick some ass and stuff. It's but, amazing. It's like having a relationship. Of yeah, an intimate relationship with somebody. Yeah, it really is amazing. So, well, thank you, man. This is great. We just yeah. went over an hour here. This that is, was an hour. Yeah. We, we, wow. We time flies when you're 20. having fun. Yeah. Imagine if we were working, we'd yeah. actually made some money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I can say is. I totally dug coming here today and doing your podcast. Oh. I can't wait to see that and badass. send me links on that so I can put it all up yeah, on yeah, my yeah. stuff too. They'll be doing it when I'm on tour with Satriani in Europe. They're going to start like you know we got to get the, the the I got a character of me. We're going to call it the I was going to call it Boom Boom Crash, but now we're going to call it uh, the Kenny Aronoff Sessions. It's just so Great. That it's just not about music and not just about drumming. It's when does that start? I think that in uh, I'm, I think I'm going to have a, a strategy meeting tomorrow, but I think. The idea is once uh, I see the treatment and the way the logo looks, uh, the character of me, then they'll start editing these things. Um, I mean, they'll start editing them maybe next week. Okay. Because, and then the idea is to launch, since I have six podcasts, to launch it in, um, I would say, the latest would be like the beginning of May. Okay. Probably the beginning of May. Let April slide by, and when if they launch, because I'll be in tour all the way till June. I'll come back June fifth. That way, if you launch in May every week, when I come back, I'll start filming right away and okay. catch up. Great, yeah. We start Lyle's summer tour on the, I think the twelfth of June, and we're out till oh, wow. the end of August. Wow. Uh, okay. We got ten, ten or eleven weeks, I think. Straight. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and. And his stuff can be rough. I mean, he said he's going to try and calm this one down. But normally in the past, we've done at least minimum five shows a week, That's maybe six. But we did some runs that were 15 <coughs> in a row. 15 in a row? Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it's really hard for the crew. I mean, the band's okay, but crew gets really brutal. And Dude. Then, and we're carrying an acoustic piano that they got to unpack in case every it. night. Wow. So. Wow, we I, we do five or six with Satriani, and I mean, I tell you what, man, that that tour elevated my drumming to a whole. Oh new man, level. tour like that, your chops are like yeah. It's I felt that way when I came off of Toto's. Yeah, oh, we my. were doing tons, and by the oh end of that God. tour, man, it's like chops, and then you come back and like, and then you're getting called to do like a country date yeah. or something. Dude, <laughs> I just did a G four in Vegas, and Luca goes, yeah, I picked the easy ones, Jake and the Bone, not easy. I mean. Pfft. You know, and then it's a handful that stuff. Dude, and, and, and there's that middle section, you know, bang, with a big guitar sound, yeah. and then it's you know, and then it's that. Uh, uh, something like that the writing is so strong so strong and Paige playing it in seven on that solo and it's, yeah it's a defined part yeah but that's what he that's the thing it's like that stuff is like when i ended up going out the first time with him i had five days to learn their show five to memorize their entire show and when we did the show live from paris which is their falling in between video it we filmed that in the second week of the tour so I mean, I, and you can't. You're up front. You can't. Oh, be I can't. I had charts. no charts, no nothing. I mean, I had to learn that stuff. I immersed myself. Who was the and drum? Was Simon on it? Simon was that. And I remember about three months into it, Simon said, "Wish we were filming now," oh, because yeah. it it evolved into a whole other space. But it was great. I mean, it was. I've never felt so much pressure as learning that whole show right. in like five days. Well, had one rehearsal in, in five days. I had, that and then we went right to Dubai and did the Dubai Jazz Festival was the first gig we played. So well, yeah, it elevated this whole thing. Playing with Joe Satriani has elevated my chops. I got to play like this double bass drum thing in 146 beats a minute, but it's just for 24 measures. But I got to practice my ass off every yeah. day and move the the metronome up to get to 100. And when I do, I have to totally relax and be zen. 
Otherwise, you lock up, you're done. Yeah. But stuff like that, I, you're not going to do with Fogarty or Mellencamp no. or Seeger. Well, it's like with Lyle. Yeah. I mean, the thing that's great with Lyle's tour is the variety of stuff going from yeah. super unbelievable breathing together, intimate stuff, to bluegrass, to Texas swing, and all yeah. that. So the show, and, yeah. and, and, and his show, he does a lot of talking, but our show is between 2.45 and 3 hours. So, you know. Well, this guy's, this guy's like... Full on. He loves me. This. Yeah. Who's playing piano in that? Jim Cox. Jim is. That's right. Yeah. So it's it's Jim Cox and me, Russ Conkle, James Harris playing Conkle's guitar. Conkle's playing drums. Yeah. Right? Russ is playing drums on. Did he always have that one guy with him forever? Well, Russ has been with him for a long time. Oh now. yes. He has been. Wow. Um, that's cool. And, Tell Russ I say. I'll see who the other guys are. See if it's the same cast of characters from last summer once we get there. Before we stop, show your bottle of wine. Oh, yeah. This so I came up this year with a bottle of wine called Uncommon Wines. Uh, it's a picture of me. It's a, a medallion that's bronze. You can take it off and wear it as a keychain or just have it. That's cool. My studio is called Uncommon Studios LA. This is Uncommon Wines. My arm tattoo says Uncommon on it. And it's a Cab Syrah. Smith Devereaux is the winery. Smith Devereaux. And uh, that's up in Napa. Uh, they only made a, uh, two barrels. Uh, we just did it because it was... Because why not? Yeah, wine Wine not. 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 Yeah. That's so, bitching. Uh, we're going to do it once a year. I'll come up with one. Badass. So good. That's so cool. Yep, very cool. Well, thanks you, my brother. All right, man. Right on, man. man the up. hands, hands. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love you, Kenny. All right, man. <laughs> okay, take care, man.